is this Verma Community Report, which we have published for a wider dissemination and discussion. Yes, breakfast. Yeah, this is what much. request uh, uh, Professor Upendra Bhaksi to release the souvenir of the abstract souvenir of the conference. Yes. Souvenir of the Indian Society of Criminology, yes, 36th All India Criminology, yes. This is the agonizing domain of uh, criminal justice system, as Professor Bhaksi has said, sufferings of the people. And uh, Justice Krishna here used to say, the little Indians are the Daridra Narayanas, are poorest of the poor. I think we need to contextualize the entire debates and discussions on rethinking criminology of how do we wipe these tears from every year and to provide freedom, ensure freedom, dignity and justice to all the communities. That's the major challenge in that context, as Professor Bhaksi has rightly pointed out, we need to develop a theory of, uh, uh, a social theory of criminology and uh, uh, some of the criminologists and uh, law professors have attempted to develop uh, some of these uh, theories, uh, uh, I think, but there's a need to uh, rethink on these uh, issues of how do we prevent the human suffering and in the context of uh, the last uh, uh, year, whether it is the 2G spectrum and the first time the activism of the Indian Supreme Court, not the first time, but uh, the uh, uh, right and opportune time of the Supreme Court taking the decision and uh, what, what we have seen, even the, the sitting uh, parliamentarians were put behind the Tihar jail. So 2G spectrum, whether it's a, in the context of the 2G spectrum, or the anti-corruption civil society initiatives, whether with uh, Anna Hazare or without Anna Hazare, and the rape law reform, uh, and also the much delayed prevention of torture, so all these we need to uh, uh, think about uh, in the whole context of the rethinking, what is a humane sentence and how do we move towards the abolition of death penalty. So in these uh, contemporary debates and discussions, this uh, conference 36th All India Criminology will throw maybe a much light and it will lead to much more uh, empirical researches for the coming few years and the Center for Criminal Justice at the National Law University Delhi will make a very uh, uh, new jurisprudence in this uh, direction. I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, particularly Justice Rajinder Sachar, uh, even though uh, because of his uh, busy schedule, uh, Justice Sachar has agreed to come. He said, uh, he would love to share uh, his ideas and the discussions with the students and the several participants. So we are grateful to Justice Rajendra Sachar for coming over in spite of his busy schedule. We are also grateful to always to Professor Bhaksi for uh, thought-provoking and inspiring, uh, uh, providing a new paradigm for rethinking on the criminology. We are uh, grateful to the Indian Society of Criminology, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Shivamurti, Chairman, Indian Society of Criminology, Professor Telagaraj, Vice Chairman, Indian Society of Criminology, for providing this opportunity to organize this 36th All India Criminology Conference. 
we are always uh, uh, inspired by the uh, our vice chancellor for his uh, uh, guidance in all these conducting of these conference uh, uh, i also must acknowledge uh, several of my colleagues those who have really played a major role in conducting of this seminar professor bajpai mukul bharati and several of these llm and llb students this uh, event uh, was sponsored by uh, bureau of police research and development ministry of home affairs ministry of women and child development government of india and uh, the frederick norman stiftung south asia regional office we uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, the regional director sage fried hego uh, present in this inaugural uh, session so we thank all the sponsors for providing uh, supporting this uh, uh, innovative program we will uh, break for the tea and uh, we will come back uh, uh, again for the presidential address uh, Uh, in this hall and the kumar appa reckless award lecture also will be delivered in this hall the tea is provided uh, just uh, in the outside the auditorium so i'll invite all of you please join for the tea rajubin professor kedi rao professor khan professor shimurti and many others who are there uh, this kind of presidential address has become a kind of ritual and every president is supposed to be because that the measure of whether he has become senile or not that is a way of testing the professor or president of the society maybe sometime they will lament for having taken this kind of risk now the <clears throat> i have uh, in this presentation i will not read the presentation i will just present it before you uh rethinking criminal justice in 21st century i have said the last two decades have been exceedingly tumultuous for indian criminology since the indian society in the post independence era has been a witness to the ever changing forms and patterns of crimes and formal as well as informal responses to them the criminological thinking has been subject to subjected to multitudes of theoretical and ideological swings in the pre 1980s period the indian criminological thinking was deeply inspired by the pro constitutional due process and humanist values that got amply reflected in the criminal policy and measures aimed at reform and rehabilitation of even the worst of criminals but in 1990s period things changed drastically in particular crimes such as transnational terrorism and extremism mega economic scams and growing elusiveness of the privileged classes and caste vast magnitude changed the very perception of crime and dynamics of addressing it all this set in motion a process of deep churning within the discipline of criminology too such a churning is intimately related to some of the following crime trends and attitudinal shifts that occurred in the society i am identifying three crime trends and attitudinal shifts that are very significant from my point of view one is uh, the backlash of the traditional and new forms of violent crimes crime in india report has indicated that violent criminality has been constantly on the rise in the past 5 decades but in the last 2 decades the rise in all forms of violent crimes has almost become phenomenal so much so that it would not be an overstatement to record 
that our society is experiencing a backlash of violent crimes such as murder, rapes, and kidnappings, etc. Such, such crimes assume special significance because they not only jeopardize some of the most cherished bodily interests of the individual, but also because they negate the very rights of citizens and erode the legitimacy of the government itself. As a consequence, the presence of violent crimes and their alarming rise poses some of the most serious challenges of governance. Then I have spoken about terrorism and how it impacts the whole crime thinking itself, criminal perception of crimes itself. I have uh, quoted uh, Justice Malimat Committee report on reforms of criminal justice which says violence and organized crimes have become the order of the day as, clause, as uh, chances of conviction are remote, crime has become a profitable business. Life, life has become unsafe and people live in constant fear, para 1.3 of the report. Some of the Malimut Committee recommendations have uh, been, have found place in the recent post-procedural law reforms. Mercifully, such ideas have not impacted the substantive law reforms as yet. Just when the Indian society was experiencing some relief from the decline of terrorism and extremism that uh, seems to have moved to other regions of Asia and Arabia, uh, the society has been hit by yet another violent crime storm in the form of rape. Though the incident of rape in urban and rural countryside has been far from unusual in the Indian society, but the single incident of Delhi gang rape on December 16 becomes a rallying point for rapes all over the country. What makes the Delhi gang rape so special? The answer lies in the unprecedented brutality and its perpetration, in its perpetration. Unprecedented breakdown of the citizens' protection system, particularly protection system for women, in the capital city of Delhi. And finally, the unprecedented uh, civil society response, assuming the shape of a large scale, peaceful demonstration of urban youth, both boys and girls, students, and employed alike. Even the formal response of the central and state government to the incident and the response to it is equally unprecedented by way of constitution of three commissions devoted to the task of suggesting rape law reforms, detailed judicial inquiries <coughs> of the incident, and exploring the causes of breakdown of policing system in Delhi. The tale of unprecedented deaths continues when the Justice Verma Committee presented before the government a 631-page report in less than a month's time. And the central government enacted a criminal law amendment ordinance 213 in a week's time. The unprecedentedness of rape law reform response is being cited here as an evidence of backlash of traditional violent crimes that have remained by and large under-researched and unexplored. But such unpreparedness, unprecedentedness would be merely a matter of record unless the community of chronologists tries to conduct scientific researches of, on the phenomena and provide viable policy and implementation level responses. Talking of violent rape crime, 
I shift the focus to a recently published article on January 24th uh, by a feminist activist, Rebecca Solnit, of the US titled A Rape a Minute, A Thousand Corpses a Year. This short article deserves to be analyzed because of its chronological insight value that needs to be inculcated in our violent crime researches and studies. After citing the US rape crime incidence statistics, the author goes to explore some of the root causes of rape and other violent crimes and arrives at a categorical conclusion that such crime are committed primarily on account of male members' socially accepted dominating position. And she says, the man, in other words, frame the situation as one in which his chosen victim had no rights and liberties, while he had the right to control and punish her. This should remind us that violence is, first of all, authoritative. It begins with this premise, I have the right to control you. According to the author, the male domination is equally matched by female subjugation, described in these words. Rape and other acts, as well as threats of violence, constitute the barrage some men lay as they attempt to control some women, and fear of that violence limits most women in ways they have gotten so used to, they hardly notice and we hardly address. The young woman described the intricate ways they stayed alert, limited their access to the world, took precaution and essentially thought about rape all the time. The chasm between their worlds had briefly and suddenly become visible. Therefore, the lessons to be learned from the backlash of traditional violent crimes is, first, each crime phenomena needs to be carefully and scientifically studied and addressed in terms of chronological theorizations. Second, the foreign research models and techniques should not blind us to our societal context and needs. In respect of terrorism and extremism, our researches and studies have been woefully inadequate and unscientific, though that particular crime phenomena is on the decline more. Third, criminological research energies should bear some kind of relationship with the, uh, with the proportionality of threat or insecurity posed to the society by such crimes. Thus, if this proportionately large number of researchers choose, choose to focus on cyber crimes or big business frauds, which constitute a very insignificant percentage of Indian crime reality, the proportionality principle would stand while it. This is what I discussed with students uh, in Bangalore conference when I saw more than 80% of research proposals were for cyber crimes. I said, this crime has only 2% in the total crime scenario. And if energies are put on this 2% crimes only, I don't think this is a proportional uh, principle is uh, upheld. The second uh, trend, I would say, is strong plea for taking criminal harm more seriously or determining criminality mainly on the basis of harm. Now on this, uh, Justice Sachar spoke on rarest of rare death penalty issue, and I have uh, said that this is a trend in the society, amongst the common people, to determine criminality on the basis of harm principle. Uh, so much so, that uh, a recent article by some Deepankar Gupta going beyond rape 
that came in Times of India of 5th January 2013 was justice is best served when it fights crime all the way from petty larceny to gruesome assaults when small acts of lawlessness are dealt with severely and promptly the police get the adrenaline to take on major crimes even stifle them at source now society is saying the distinction between petty crimes and serious crimes should be obliterated because a crime is a crime and it has to be taken seriously. Now it is the harm principle. Theoretically speaking, criminal liability requires both actor spheres and guilty mind mensia elements. Guilty mind element is in a way treated as the essence of crime that is invariably associated with the blameworthy state of mind. That is the main reason for limiting instances of strict criminal liability which are treated more like an exception. Harm as an aggravating factor has a special significance in death penalty debate. I have not gone to the rarest of rare debate, but I have taken that debate as uh, a manifestation of harm principle. And uh, it may manifest in cruel, diabolic, or barbaric way, or ruthlessness of perpetration, or helplessness of victim, and everything that is related to the heinousness of crime. The Supreme Court decision in Machi Singh in 1983 had gone to elaborate the circumstances relating to crime in terms of five situations, very elaborately uh, singled out. Overall effect of harm factor needs to be balanced with the circumstances relating to criminal or mitigating circumstances that was expressly laid down by the Supreme Court constitutional bench ruling in Bachan Singh in 1980. However, in Raoji versus State of Rajasthan, 1996, a two-judge bench of the Supreme Court again restored the harm principle by holding that in cases of gruesome homicides that cause grave, grave social indignation, only the characteristic relating to crime to the exclusion of the one relating to criminal are relevant in sentencing matters. In Raoji's case, they went beyond what uh, the constitutional bench in Bajan Singh had said, balancing the crime and criminal. And uh, they said, and I was thinking, you know, why did uh, Justice Pasai in Raoji case, because it is the fascination of harm factor, harm principle. And again, this Raoji ruling, though it was par incurium, as uh, pointed out by Justice Sinha in Santosh Kumar Beriyar in 2009, was followed by 10 Supreme Court benches that in case of heinous crimes, The mitigating circumstances, circumstances relating to criminal need not be considered. And therefore, the doing away with balancing test of purchasing was uh, welcomed by not only Raoji and Justice Pasayat, but uh, several other decisions. Now, it is interesting that a recent two-judge bench of the Supreme Court in Guruel Singh was the state uh, delivered on 6th February. Justice Radha Krishna has brought back the harm principle in a new garb. He says, I do not agree with crime test. I do not agree with criminal test. I do not also agree with the balancing of crime and criminal test. The third test is that he spells out 
is factors like society's abhorrence, extreme indignation, and antipathy to the crime like rape and murder of minor girls, especially the ones who are intellectually challenged, should be taken into account. Now, abhorrence of the society, society's abhorrence to the crime, again, you're going back to crime test. It's a new variant of Rauji by seemingly going away from Rauji, but uh, a new variant of Rauji. Now, uh, I comment on this because I have not very deeply applied, but how and to what extent should this abhorrence, feeling of abhorrence of the society, society in Gujarat may not have felt abhorred by rapes followed by murder, society in some other place may feel abhorred. So, is it so subjectively moving, seeing the society's mind? And again, you're going back to the crime test that was rejected by Bhajan Singh. Bhajan Singh said the crime and criminal both should be balanced. Therefore, you are, the harm principle has gone up to the Supreme Court also as in Gurwail Singh's case in 2013. Now, the third trend, which to my mind is again very significant, rising clamor for severity of punishment. <coughs> the public anger against Delhi gang rape accused was for inflicting of swift and severe punishment to all the six rapists. The strong demand for enhancement of punishment was diversely responded by Justice Verma Committee that declined to recommend death for any form of rape, but agreed to enhance it up to 30 years imprisonment for aggravated rapes. In addition to enhancing minimum and maximum terms of imprisonment for all forms of rape, as a consequence such attitudinal shift on punishment, the death penalty abolition debate has not come to a premature end, but uh, the courts and executive is feeling emboldened in passing death penalty verdicts with less weight on their conscience and the number of rejection of mercy petitions have considerably increased with larger number of executions in the coming days. As a matter of fact, the thrust of chronological initiatives, right from classical list plea of testing every punishment in the touchstone of utility, to positivist receipt of individualizing of punishment to treat criminal of his uh, sickness was to rationalize the quantum of punishment and humanize its forms. The United Nations strove relentlessly to work towards the task of prevention of crime and treatment of offenders, evidence by five-yearly Congress on Prevention of Crime and Treatment of Offenders since 1955. Every five-year treatment of offenders, standard minimum rules, standard minimum rules of prison, prison justice. In matters of recall of death penalty, two powerful views, one held by Arundhati Roy, relating to Afzal Guru, who was already executed, who is already executed, are presented here for your consideration. Uh, Arundhati Roy, in this article on 10th February 2013 in Hindu, a perfect day for democracy, 
she says but now that afzal guru has been hanged i hope our collective conscience has been satisfied or is our cup of blood still only half full are we looking for more blood are we looking for more executions we are still not satisfied we like more and the second article second views are uh, reflected by kalpana kanabira she has relied on a letter written by madam sonia gandhi as she has understood her letter relating to assistance of her husband and father of her two children who had await execution uh, kalpana kanabiran says sonia gandhi and her children in the matter of death penalty say that a principle that separates personal anger and grief from the idea of justice it is this principle that should guide parliamentary and governmental deliberations on the death penalty and is and indeed also guide deliberations on clemency thereby setting new measures for the practice of politics and indeed governance in india its repeated negation in letter and spirit is very worrying sign of our times kalpana kanaviran has written in uh, hindu on 10th february 2000 now these are the three trends trend of backlash of violent crimes trend of plea for criminality being determined on the basis of harm and the trend of punishment being made more stringent and severe particularly death penalty uh the fourth part is the summing up part i would say the search for new lines of chronological thinking are called for as described by sutherland the criminology in 1940s was dominated by crime criminal and punishment today's criminological concerns have gone beyond that for the democratic society based on determinate constitutional foundations the line of chronological thinking have to take into cognizance some of the following and the following are growing tendency of challenge to states monopoly of defining crimes why there is a growing tendency among people the common man why street protest is all right amrit sen had said somewhere but street justice is not all right why people want to take upon themselves the task of street justice also because the state wants to retain the monopoly of defining crimes and this has got to be understood in the context of uh, what uh, stephen box had written in his book power crime and mystification for too long too many people have been socialized to see crime and criminals through the eyes of the state consensus tradition in criminology teaches us that state knows everything harmful human conduct that sovereign desires to prevent therefore this is being critiqued or challenged the second challenge is challenge is much more is the challenge is much more directed to the criminal justice system itself way back in 1940s Professor Wolfgang had written that uh, that uh, it is time uh, we have focused long enough on the offender and his weaknesses. It is time that we look to the chaotic, decaying, and degrading system and indict it for its failures. The decaying police system, the decaying court system. 
and degrading and all that problems arise at that stage. Unfortunately, the Burma Committee has not uh, looked to the decaying systems that we are to work our justice, criminal justice administration. The third challenge is the challenge of impregnating the thinking with constitutional rights, criminological thinking with constitutional rights-based culture. This is the most difficult thing. The traditional criminological thinking is much more tuned to the language of force of criminal law that at best tends to create a security regime operated by the state. The core issue is to ensure the safety and dignity of all the citizens, more so the vulnerable sections like women and children within a rights-oriented regime that the Constitution envisages to guarantee. <clears throat> Right-oriented regime will enable us to understand better the logic of Burma Committee recommendation for doing away with the exemption accorded to the marital rape or armed forces rapes better. It will also make us see the logic in classifying most of the sexual crimes in a distinct chapter on offences against bodily integrity and individual autonomy. Finally, the challenge, the fourth challenge is challenge of getting away from colonial hangover of controlled criminology. Seeing crime and criminals in a retributive frame not only provides justification for state repression in individual cases, but also goes a long way in the construction of an overall repressive state. The colonial state operated merrily through such an approach of control criminology, apparatus of control criminology, which is described by Biko Agosino in, uh, as gunboat, gunboat criminology of imperialism. Uh, for developing and strengthening alternate criminological thinking, we have to fall back on the lessons of diverse human rights struggles, one, two, inculcate respect for Gandhian values of ahimsa, satyagra and other forms of non-violent struggles, three, identify restorative justice practices prevalent in informal conflict resolution systems and inculcate respect for, inculcate respect for human dignity that in the words of Justice Dando, is uh, human dignity borne in mind, we must consider that everyone's personality is capable of developing infinitely at any stage of one's life. Thank you very much this, for a patient hearing. Thank you very much again.